Hello together, and welcome to the last talk before lunch. We will try to make an enjoyable one. We, that is Eva and me, Matthias, two true icons of Comedia, and today we talk about hot deployment of Studio plugins. <laughs> So this is the agenda. Um, the feature of hot deploying Studio plugins rests on the new foundation of Dynamic Studio packages. And I, want, I think I need to make this clear from the get-go, because when we practiced this talk in front of our colleagues, they said, oh, Matthias, you're talking about Studio packages, and the next second you're talking about Studio plugins. So what are you really talking about? What I'm really talking about is that the mechanism we present um, applies to all Studio packages. Um, client packages, but the packages that we are most interested in are those with plugins in them, because plugins are the main tool to extend the studio. So during the talk, I will most of the time use the more general term studio packages, but just keep in mind that the most interesting and relevant packages are the studio plugin packages. I will, I will give a short introduction into the topic, um, and then I will present different scenarios of how to make use of Dynamic Studio plugins. I will also present a workspace of how to best develop them. Then I hand over to Eva, who will present some more technical details on our scenario two, um, on, on our out-of-the-box uh, out scenario, and who has also prepared a nice demo. So let's get to it. What are Dynamic Studio packages? What does this feature provide? Well, basically, dynamic studio packages can be loaded into a running studio. I'm not talking of a, um, of a developer studio, of course, where you can always add stuff, but a production studio in the cloud, maybe. And um, why do we like it? Well, the thing is, you can now develop your studio plugins as dynamic packages and add them to a running studio without the need to uh, rebuild everything and restart or redeploy the server. You're really hot deploying your, studios, uh, your plugins into the running studio. And you can just as easily leave them out later on. Um, what do we exactly mean by dynamic? Well, the thing is, as you very probably know, we use XJS as our JavaScript framework on which the studio is running. And in order to have it running, we needed an XJS app. And such an app is built with central command. And traditionally, we had all of our studio packages being included in the central command build of the XJS Studio app. So the packages were statically linked into the application. Now we have some packages, the dynamic ones, that are not included in the build of the XJS Studio app, but they are loaded later on on top of the app and are then, of course, also part of the overall application. And we're basically, this was, of course, possible before, because uh, a Studio package consists of JavaScript, CSS, and JSON. And sure, you can load those, those resources anytime you want, but you had to do it manually, and you had to consider a lot of stuff. For example, um, what about uh, dependencies, the load order between dynamic packages? Um, does the client need to know which packages are dynamic and which not? And where do dynamic packages come from, if not from the same origin as the XJS app? So, Quite some questions, lots of hassle, and no support by XJS. So what we did is we built um, dynamic packages support into our combination of XJS and Jangaroo, and that allows you to deal with dynamic packages very comfortably, we think. Limitations. Um, the first one is, is not really a limitation, I think. I, I hope it has gotten clear that I'm talking about Studio client packages. I'm not talking about REST backend extensions. But Studio dynamic packages are just like any studio package. They can access the full spectrum of our client-side remote layer. They can alter content, access product catalogs, create projects, and whatever. Um, a real limitation is that because they are not included in the XJS Studio app, um, dynamic packages cannot contribute to the studio theme. Uh, you, you cannot define SCSS variables and SCSS resources. What you can do is add some pure CSS rules. That works. Um, let, if I will later on um, point out some further limitations when we have uh, get a more clearer picture of, of, of the feature, um, just keep in mind this is the first iteration of this dynamic packages feature. There are some loose ends we need to pick up, but it's already working quite well. One thing I want to mention is that um, oh, the limitations. Yeah, sure. One thing I want to mention is that um, oh yeah, 
sorry, that um, the real MVP of this dynamic packages feature is actually the new uh, client package loader, which was introduced with Jangaroo 4059. Um, but today we will not really talk in detail about the package loader. I just wanted to make sure to mention the poor guy so that its contribution is not completely sweeped under the rug. Package loader. Okay. Um, how does it really work? This here is in a very simplified way how the studio has worked for quite some time. Well, you have a studio client, your browser, it loads the, the resources of the XJS Studio app from the studio server, and it makes some REST calls. For the sake of simplicity, I will continue to talk of a studio server. It's not always that simple. For example, as you might know in our Docker deployment, the XJS Studio app and the REST layer are served from different Docker containers, but for this conceptual perspective here, it's, it's not really that important, so I just stick with the, uh, with the term A Studio Server. Um, this has been... Well, it's not really working, I think. Hmm. Okay. This has been the case before Comedia 1810. Now it's a bit different. Now we have an additional dynamic packages, JSON, which is loaded, and it contains a list of dynamic packages. And as I mentioned before, those are the packages that are not included in the XJS Studio app, but are loaded later on on top of the app, and are then, of course, also part of the overall application. For the client, it doesn't matter which packages are dynamic and which not. It just merges all the package manifests together, brings them in the right load order, and tries to load them all from the Studio server, which in this case <coughs> provides them. This is the next important thing. Since um, Comedia 1810, dynamic studio packages are already part of the blueprint. We have simply declared many of our blueprint studio extensions as being dynamic, namely exactly those ones that do not do any extra S theming. This is now uh, why we have, in the blueprint, we have two client extension points now. Okay, it really doesn't. Okay, we have the we have the traditional studio extension points for the for the uh, static studio packages. They all end up in the studio base app module, which is the real XJS app. And then we have a new extension point, Studio Dynamic, which is for the dynamic studio um, studio extensions. They end up in the in the module Studio App, which is then this this dynamic part loaded on top of the of the XJS app. And well, you might want to consider letting your own um, custom Blueprint Studio extensions also be part of this dynamic extension point, because um, the advantage is that if you change something in your extensions, you do not need to rebuild the whole XJS app, you just need to rebuild this dynamic extension point. Um, so the, the takeaway here is that since Comedia 1810, the dynamic packages mechanism is already up and running, and the studio server, the standard Blueprint Studio server, already serves dynamic and static studio packages. But you're maybe now wondering, Matthias, until now there is not much hot deploying going on in this talk. Very true. So let's get to that. Let's assume you have developed some studio plugins, maybe not even Blueprint related, and you want to throw them at a running studio and have them become activated. You do not want to rebuild everything, and you cannot or do not want to restart the studio server. So what are your options? Um, the first solution that we propose is a proxy solution. This up here is the standard Blueprint Studio server from before. We did not touch it. Nothing happened. But your client now no longer talks directly to the studio server. Instead, it, it talks to this proxy. The proxy needs to be configured in a way that it proxies most requests just through to the standard Blueprint Studio, namely all the REST calls, of course, and also um, the requests for the standard Blueprint Studio packages, static and dynamic ones. But you now have an extended or a new version of dynamic packages JSON, which holds an extended list of dynamic packages, including your new Studio Plugin packages. And as they are now part of this list, the client, of course, wants to load them. And as they are obviously not served by the standard Blueprint server up here, they have to be served directly by the proxy server. This is a very 
simple, it needs solution. Yeah, you have this, this standard Blueprint Studio, which does most of the work, and you have the proxy server, which only serves a fragment of the overall requests, um, namely exactly those ones that deal with your new plugin packages. For the client, it appears to be a whole new Studio application, but for this Blueprint server up here, nothing at all has changed. With uh, dynamic packages, this really works like a charm. You can, for example, have this mothership studio, and around it you have some proxies branding the studio in different ways, adding different functionality for different tenants, maybe. One further note, um, this is for development purposes. We have built this proxy solution into our Jangaroo tooling. The Jangaroo run goal now can work with a remote studio server and some local dynamic packages, and it sets up an embedded jetty that does just this proxying thing that I just described. Well, once again, you probably do not want to have an embedded Jangaroo jetty in your production system, so there you would have to set up a real proxy. And I guess there are many among you who are like, yeah, Sounds kind of okay, but setting up a proxy server to bring some studio plugins into being, not really into it. And we expected that, we accept that, and so we have another solution. And this solution is what we have directly built into our 1810 uh, and upwards, of course, Comedia products. Uh, this is the good old picture. You have the standard Blueprint Studio server serving uh, REST calls and also serving the Blueprint Studio packages, static and dynamic ones. But now you can um, specify in a settings document some additional remote locations for Studio packages. Just some URLs under which additional Studio packages lie and, and shall be loaded. And if these, if these additional URLs um, are within the range of whitelisted URLs, then they contribute to this dynamic packages JSON here, um, which is no longer just a file, but is, is computed or recomputed every time the studio is reloaded. And just as before, the client merges all the package manifests, brings them in the right load order, and then wants to load all the, all the packages, including uh, the ones from the new locations that you specified. And now, in this solution, you do not have to worry about proxying yourself. The Studio server is automatically configured to proxy um, the request for the additional dynamic packages specified here just through to the remote locations. And um, I've, I've called them file server here. It's just meant as a generic term for something where you can host your, your packages. Might be a Tomcat, Nginx, might be an S3 bucket. It doesn't really matter as long as the Studio um, can, can reach it and access the package resources. So really, the only thing you have to do in this scenario is take your uh, dynamic packages, artifacts, upload them to a server, and add a, a new remote package location to the settings document I mentioned. There are some more details in the Studio Manual, or you can just wait two more minutes until Eva takes over and provides some more technical details and also shows a live, shows a live demo. There's one further thing I want to touch before handing over. This is um, how to develop. Oh, yeah, I, I already said that. OK. Um, how to develop dynamic packages. And um, here we, we just have a, have a look at the IntelliJ IDEA view of such, a, of such a workspace. And the cool thing is, you really need just a small workspace which builds within seconds, which is very much opposed to rebuilding the Studio XJS app, which takes several minutes. And in this workspace, you have some uh, plugin packages. There's nothing new here. Studio plugins look uh, like they always have. And you have an app overlay module. We call those app overlays because they are supposed to take a real XJS app and overlay it with additional functionality. And if we look into the POM file of this um, overlay module, we see there is a OK. <laughs> There's a new packaging type, Jangaroo App Overlay. Uh, before, there was only Jangaroo App, which is a real XJS app. Um, and in, in this app overlay, you need to have a dependency to a real XJS app. It is allowed for this overlay to depend on another overlay, but somewhere in this chain, there has to be a real XJS slash Jangaroo app. Then, of course, you have some uh, plugin packages that you want to serve as dynamic packages. And if you have a look at the, at the artifacts that come out of this, not very surprisingly, 
There is a dynamic packages JSON with a list of your additional plugin packages. These are here. And of course, you get the resources for the plugin packages themselves. And in the proxy scenario that I mentioned earlier, you just let your proxy serve these resources here directly and set up proxy rules for everything else to the mothership standard Blueprint Studio. In the second scenario, let's call it the remote URL scenario, you just take these files here, upload them to a file server, and then you add the URL of this dynamic packages JSON. This is the URL that you add to this settings document of additional locations. And this is a perfect opportunity to hand over to Eva for the fun part of the talk, where you see it all in action. OK, thank you. OK, I want to go in depth for solution number two. And here I want um, to show you how to load the Studio UI and what happens. First of all, you have your browser, browser and you have the Studio server. And we have got an JS um, file editor main. And there's a method, load plugins. And this method uses the package loader to request the dynamic packages JSON. And this request. Uh, comes to the studio server, and now we have a servlet which reacts on this request, and this servlet collects and serves all static and remote packages as list. And you have to set the remote URLs into a special settings document, and oops, it's double clicked. Hmm. And the URLs for, um, for the remote servers have to be whitelisted, as Matthias already said. And the result is a JSON file, as you can see here, um, with all packages which should be loaded. And the next step is what happens if one studio package is requested. Now, again, we have a brow our browser and the studio server. And for each package in this list, the package loader requests the package. And now we have implemented a filter which looks up um, from which location to load the package from. Either it loads it from the static resources directly, or it proxies it from the remote server. And in the end, if everything is loaded, you see, you used to do UI. Yeah, <laughs> that it was. <coughs> so um, now we are coming to the fun part. The preliminaries for this live demonstrations are that I set up, um, I have a local setup based upon Comedia product CMS 9 in version 80.10.2. And I uploaded, I already uploaded a studio package to AWS3, and I uploaded a studio package to my local Nginx server, so that we can see um, both um, packages working right now. And both URLs I already added to my whitelist of the studio server. So now oh, I have to switch. OK, here we are. First of all, here is my whitelist. And as you can see, this is the URL or the location form of my local engine X. And this one is the location for my AWS 3 bucket. And we already talked about a special settings docu document. You have to add one in the global settings, below options and settings. And the name of the document has to be dynamic packages. So, and there you have to add a string list named remote URLs. And as, if you can, as you can see, in my apps, there are just these ones. And now I will copy the URL to my remote list. And when I reload the studio, there should be 
a new app. And here it is. It's called DEFCON. And it's just a window which pops up. But I also have another uh, location from my S3 bucket. If I put it here and reload the studio, you will see the background image changes. No, it doesn't. It's the same. OK. Oh, no, it's from my local engine. Sorry. So I edit, I reload the studio, and now you have a nice picture. And I changed the colors as well. So, and the nice part is you just have to add a plugin location. So, um, if you want on runtime, add another plugin. I will prepare it right now. So, I add this. And this plugin isn't uploaded to my local engine X right now, so nothing more happens. But if I <coughs> copy it to my local engine X and reload it, now you will have a colorful studio. So this is quite nice. Just um, whitelist your plugin locations, um, add it to the settings document, and you have a hopefully working studio package. But what will happen if, if your package um, is damaged, broken, whatever? I will fake this. Now, it could be the case that your studio won't load at all, because something happens, as you see here. So we added a safe mode. This enables the user to disable the remote package, dynamic packages functionality. So you can either remove it from your plugins location, or delete this document, or remove the faulty one, I think this it was. And if I reload the studio, it reloads again because I removed the broken one and you are back in your studio UI. Yeah, that it was. This was a very short demonstration. And now I will go back to the demonstration. So there are some restrictions, as Matthias already said. Um, it's the first iteration of this feature. And here. one of this is the activation of this feature is um, globally. You can't activate it only for one user or for one site. If you activate it, you activate it for everyone. And all packages have to be listed explicitly. You saw that I added remote URLs to the document. There is no wildcard declaration. And this is another limitation to your plugin location, to your file server, or whatever. You have to upload the exploded remote package. We have no possibility right now to upload a char file. And there is no quality check on the loaded remote packages. You have to do this on your, do it this on your own and verify that it works. And only use remote packages from trusted sources um, because we have no security check right now. <coughs> yeah, but what are the future plannings about this topic? So we want to provide jars. Um, we want that you can provide jars instead of exploded um, jars at the file server. And we want to add a security enhancement so that you can upload signed jars so we can check if the package has been um, corrupted or something like this. Maybe you can able and disable the plugin via the settings document via a checkbox. 
And um, the bigger one is that we want to provide something like an automatic plugin discovery. So you just uh, provide um, the file location or the location where your remote dynamic packages are stored, and um, the server just collects all which are deployed there. Yeah, that it was. Um, thank you. And now it's time for your questions. was obviously self-explanatory. <laughs> ah, right there. Sorry. Where, 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 where? Ah, oh, there. Hi. Um, was there any technical reason why I chose the external um, proxy server or an external service instead of just uploading the files to the content server? It's it was just uh, the first solution that we had because, yeah. because it was more easily and then we, we, we uh, suspected and accepted that probably it would be a bit too cumbersome for, for everybody to use it and then we, the, we built this proxying ability directly into our studio server. But um, in, in, in some sense the first solution with uh, the proxy solution is a bit more powerful because you can have multiple proxies around this studio mothership and have them serving different um, yeah, different studio plugins, and in the second solution, you have this one studio server with the with the XJS app, and there you add remote locations. So it's it's more comfortable, but the um, the proxy solution is in some ways a bit more powerful. But I was talking about um, we have the theme upload where we can upload the front end themes into the studio. Why not have the ah. plugins for the studio as content objects? Yeah, this is. Uh, very easily done if we want to have it. You have to talk to our product management. But this is uh, <laughs> with, a, yeah, I mean, with with this mechanic. Well, we um, we actually had had the solution um, in a in a in a prototype, and then we went one step back and wanted to uh, to first provide uh, the technical foundation for this feature, but uh, uploading your your plugins in the content repository just for the uh, just as for the theme upload, it's 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 not not difficult. We could do that. Sure. Thank you. Everybody wants to go to lunch. It is served, by the way. Just like it, huh? No more questions. There's one. Just one question: uh, How is the load order um, generated for the plugins? Um, I don't know. Do you know the internal loading order of the package loader? Um, yeah, the package loader does it. Um, yeah. Well, and, and, um, um, each, each package has a, has a manifest with its dependencies, and this is taken into consideration by the package loader. I think okay. I might have an idea on <coughs> who Sorry. in the audience might have an answer to that question. <laughs> there, was, uh, there was a bug in the package loader, uh, which was Exactly about the order. So of course it takes uh, Maven dependencies are uh, converted into the load order. So if you have a Maven dependency on, on another package, of course the other package is loaded first and then yours. But of course this is not a, a sequence, but it's just a directed graph. So there could be different orders uh, in which the packages are loaded. And because we have, an, uh, we have a UI, uh, the sequence matters for, for, the, for the user. For example, if the first plugin plugs a button into a toolbar and the second plugs a button in the same toolbar and they are loaded, they have no dependencies on each other, the buttons could be in reverse order. If you reload, they're in the other order. If you reload, they're in this order. Nobody wants to have that. So what did we do? We uh, sorted the, the uncomparable or in, in, incomparable plugins which have no dependencies on each other were just sorted alphabetically. But there was a bug in this algorithm <laughs> which caused them to be, to kind of uh, sometimes forget the dependency order. So we have fixed that in the meantime, but now kind of uh, dependencies have precedence and if they, have, if they are incomparable by dependency, then they are uh, sorted alphabetically. So they have a, uh, they have a uh, well, repeatable order or a, 
stable or okay <laughs> so that's a little, long story so I uh, thank you for, for the talk um, I, I'm not really sure that if I really understood which problem this solves um, so I mean I, I already can do that to have a uh, red blue deployment for the studio front end files I can just use your docker container with with a, with a single page application and I can just make a red blue deployment and it just works so we do that actually and um, now I have the possibility to 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 have have a hot swap of these plugins in these files and in this is in this s3 bucket example and this nginx server but if I want to then make sure that I really understand the bug of a client in a certain version, this seems to me quite horrible to debug, to be honest. So then I have to find out which version was active at this point of time, and I need to figure that out. But if I would have just a Docker container, which is maybe just stored somewhere, then I can just deploy it on my machine and make sure that I really have the same version. So I understand the point of that it's easier to, to build this single plugin instead of the whole application, but is this, is this the point why you did that, or is there something I missed the talk? It's, it's not offensive, I just want to try to understand that. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, the thing is that um, this, the request to have something like that arose from our customers. They, they want to say, I, I have this uh, studio running in the cloud, maybe it's not so easy. To, to access the containers, you say it's, it's easy for you because you can just upload the resources there, restart the Docker container, everything is okay. But um, it's, 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 it appears to not be that easy for, for all, of, all of the setups for all our customers. I wanted to have the, the possibility to change, especially change little things with a running studio without redeploying, restarting anything. Um, I, I think it, it, it really, um, it, it's not, not the normal case that you change big stuff in your studio. Uh, the request was, uh, I want to add some field in a form which writes in a struct. And um, it's, um, it's, it, it may not, not always be that easy to access the containers, restart them. So it's, it's, it's just a request that we got and uh, yeah, it, it was fun to implement it. Yeah. <laughs> Frank? So uh, you're right that maybe for deployment it's it's not not the uh, something you really need. I think uh, what you didn't see in in the presentation because we didn't have time to show all that is that the development uh, changes also. So it's it's more of a develop uh, it's more of a development tool so that if you develop a studio plugin you can kind of focus on on building your plugin and then uh, have a c have kind of dynamic linking so you can compare that to static and dynamic linking in other programming languages and the, the, the weird thing is that although JavaScript is a very dynamic language Sencha command has a very static build process so they kind of do static linking with this dynamic language and you always have to repeat this static linking step after changing uh, or adding adding your plugin so uh, this feature is, for, from my point of view, it's mainly a developer feature where the de developers can, can kind of uh, develop DLLs and these are dynamically linked into your studio and you can try them out without rebuilding all this huge studio which becomes larger and larger uh, and while well, rebuild times take like minutes in, instead of seconds. And when you're done with developing, so what, what you can see in the demonstration is that, that you can do this dynamic linking very dynamically. You can even do it by, by configuring it uh, in content uh, at runtime. And this is like an operation on, on, on the heart without any, uh, well, you, you should only do that in a, in a testing environment, of course. If you just hit a button and all, all your studios for all editorial staff are broken, that wouldn't be a good idea. So of course you would still have different deployments, or, or you could have different different deployments, but your build process becomes much e much simpler. Lunch time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>